then uh, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, so my name is Pauline, I'm one of the International Trade and Customs Advisor uh, here at the Chamber and I'll be presenting today's session. So as you, your lady said, we'll be talking about import basics. So we'll just go through the processes involved uh, in importing, so the various steps. Uh, we won't go into um, much detail, so it's not an in-depth presentation. Um, so hope that helps. Um, so just to start, what's an import? So we did this session back in October. And if you attended, you will have seen that we did a distinction at the time between imports and acquisitions. So when the, EU, when the UK was part of the European Union, we were classifying everything coming from the EU as an acquisition. So all the processes involved in that were completely different. Um, now, uh, and since the January the 1st, everything coming from outside the UK is now considered an import. So all the processes that we are going to cover today will be applicable to anything coming uh, from outside the United Kingdom. So we're only going to look at the practical and technical aspect of importing, not the strategy and finding um, suppliers. So um, the first step um, when you pass an order with your supplier overseas, uh, whether in the EU or outside the EU, will be to agree the terms of sales. So there are a number of um, things to keep in mind when you are negotiating with your supplier, which we will touch on um, in a second. So these are the payment terms. Uh, the shipping and insurance, which is uh, the INCO terms, um, the commodity code and its implications, and documentation, and everything there that I've listed will have an impact on the final price. So it's very important that when you are talking to your supplier overseas, that you bear in mind all these criteria so that you make sure that the final price um, it's, uh, very, it's taking into account everything that we've listed. So um, the payment terms. So depending on the country where you're importing from and your relationship with the supplier, you usually have a choice um, of payment terms um, and methods of payment. I would recommend to always consider the benefits and disadvantages of each. So I've listed a couple here. So you've got advanced payment when you pay, uh, obviously, at, at, the to at the point of order, the letters of credit and documentary collection when um, you get extra security by involving the banks in the transaction or open account. So all of these have their own benefits and disadvantages. So advanced payment is an ideal term for an exporter because you get your payment before you ship. But in this condition, when we are uh, talking about being the importer, uh, it's an extra risk. So if you don't know the supplier, before you agree to pay on advance payment, always do due diligence, always do a credit check to make sure that um, you will get your goods. Um, letters of credit is uh, a good terms for both the exporter and the supplier. You get added security that um, as the importer, you will get your goods. As the exporter, you will get your payment, um, but it can cost quite a lot so um, and takes a lot of time. So there are resources to bear in mind if you agree to do letters of credit. With some markets like Pakistan, uh, letters of credit is a very common terms, um, but just bear in mind the um, extra cost and resources that will be needed. Um, obviously, if the payment is made in another currency, uh, we would also recommend to consider the impact of foreign exchange on the transaction. If you are um, paying in another currency, is it worth having another account? Or if it's something brand new to you, you might have just, just been using your, your bank, but there might be customs uh, foreign exchange broker that can uh, provide better solutions for you. So um, if it's new to you, I would really recommend you look into it to see if there are better options for you to manage the risks of um, changing currency rates. So INCO terms. So INCO terms are international commercial terms. They define the responsibilities for the buyer and the seller with respect to the packing, the transport, the insurance, and the customs procedures. So they are managed by the, by the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris, and they are reviewed every 10 years. Uh, the last version was launched last year at the start of January 2020, and there are 11 terms in the latest version. If you've been using older, older terms, that's completely fine. You just need to make sure you quote the year when you agree the sale with your um, with your supplier or your buyer. Um, so everybody knows which uh, version you are working with. So as we said, the INCO terms helps you as the importer and as the exporter to avoid misunderstanding by clearly defining each other's responsibility. So to illustrate this, 
I'm just, um, you should see on your screen now an infographic that we've developed at the Chamber and which clearly shows you uh, for each term where the responsibility is transferred from one party to the other. So if we look at X works, for example, as the importer, there are a lot of responsibilities attached to using that term. So the exporter's only responsibility is to have the goods available at their warehouse. They don't even have to load the goods on the truck. It's your responsibility as the importer to arrange this. And then you are responsible for the transport all the way um, to its final destination. As the importer under X works, you're also responsible for the export clearance, which is an added difficulty, which we'll touch on later on, as you have to find someone in market that can clear the goods for you. Um, and it can just be quite difficult sometimes to find someone in market to do this. Um, you can see that FCA, for example, is a similar term to X works. The only difference is that the exporter is doing the customs clearance, and you, as the importer, you are only responsible once the goods have been have been loaded. So. Um, we usually recommend using FCA instead of XWorks. It might work for you to use XWorks, but just bear in mind the responsibilities that are involved. Uh, another term that I'd like to highlight here is DDP, so delivered duty paid. Um, as an importer, it's actually quite a good um, term for you because you don't have to do anything. You just wait for the goods to be delivered to you. The exporter has to do everything else. Um, the customs clearance on export and import and managing the transport, the insurance and the cost all the way from the country of origin to its final destination. And then in between those two terms, um, you've got um, more terms here. We'll send the, the slides after the session so you can see a copy of the infographic and you can see clearly um, where your responsibility starts or where it ends. Then the tariff codes and the duty applicable. So this is something that you also need to bear in mind when you're agreeing the order with your customer. Understanding what the tariff code is will allow you to understand what duty you might have to pay at import. So um, a tariff code, uh, it's also can be called a commodity code or an HS code, is a product specific code which allows countries to classify traded goods on a common basis for customs purposes. So this is what will determine what duty you have to pay at import and if there are any restrictions, regulations or safeguard duties, for example, applicable to that product. So um, the exporter is responsible for classi classifying the good, but as the importer, you have a responsibility as well to check that the commodity code that you have been given is correct. Um, if you use the wrong commodity code, uh, whether you didn't know it was wrong or you thought you might get less duty, this is illegal and um, it can lead you to pay the incorrect amount of duties, but you can also get fined and get penalties um, such as losing your licenses or any other special procedures that you've applied for and had authorization to use. If um, So when you do the import clearance, for example, you have to instruct the customs broker what commodity code will be using. So even though you will have gotten that um, commodity code from the exporter, you will have you will be the one responsible for the information on that document. So you will be the one uh, held responsible, even though it wasn't um, your decision. Um, so always check that. If there are any disagreements between you and the exporter and you uh, want a legally binding decision to be made, you can request this um, with HMRC through the tariff binding ruling. Um, and then you'll get a legally um, um, binding tariff code that if customs were to question the commodity code that you're using, you can say um, uh, HMRC told us to use that one. So for import, your tariff code should be 10 digits long. Um, our export, it's eight. Uh, and the first six digits are always the same everywhere in the world. So um, always check when you're given a tariff code, which whatever is eight or 10 digits, that is also the same one or that is accurate in the UK. Um, there's the website here. As I say, you'll get the slides. So you'll be able to see that, um, that link if you're not um, familiar with this website. But um, you can see this is a screenshot of the website, so you can enter the name of the commodity code and uh, the, the name of the product to help you classify um, the product, but you can also enter the commodity code and this is where you will find out what duty, VAT and any restrictions applicable to your product. So always this should be part of your first step when you are passing an order overseas. And finally, the other thing that you need to bear in mind at this stage is what info documentation will be required um, at the border. 
and what regulations are applicable to your product. So it might be that you need a document to claim preferential rates. It might be uh, that you need the document for proving the origin of the goods, or if you're importing animal products that you need an animal health certificate, or if it's food to prove that the goods are fit for human consumption. So there are a range of uh, certificates that might be required. Um, this is uh, at this stage that you need to look into it because someone will have to pay for those um, documents. And again, depending on the income terms you've chosen, you might be responsible for um, arranging this. So just remember to check that, um, make sure you're aware of what documents you need so that when you arrive in the UK, there's no surprises and you are prepared. So I've listed a number of documents here that you might be able um, might need to use. We won't go into details on them. Since this is a completely different session. Um, but if you need any help with that, um, let us know after the session and we can uh, refer you to the right um, webinar. So um, we've passed the order with the supplier. We've agreed the terms of sale. We're completely comfortable with uh, the price. And now uh, the goods are ready to leave the country of origin. So this from now on everything will depend on the income terms you've chosen so depending on the income term you've chosen you might need to arrange the export customs declaration and the transport and insurance um basically if you use xworks so if you use any of the other terms you don't have to do uh, to worry about the export customs clearance and transport uh, but if you are using xworks you are the one party responsible for arranging the customs export declaration in the country of origin and the payments of duties and taxes. At export, it's quite unlikely that there will be duty or tax payable, but it can happen. So always check. There is a link at the bottom of the slide as well that we will share with you after today's uh, session, which is a new digital tool that was launched by the Department for International Trade last year. And it allows you to check um, overseas duty rates and regulations, so everything local. So um, if you are selling it, if you are buying X works and you want to make sure that uh, there is no duty or tax, please check on this website, but it's, it's quite rare. So you still need to arrange the export declaration. So you need to find someone in market that is able to do it. So a lot of the customs broker in the UK can, then, can only do import into the UK or export from the UK. So you will need to find someone in market. So if you're using a freight agent, for example, they might have an office in market sometimes where they can do the declaration for you and they might have a partner that they can refer you to. Uh, you can also speak to your supplier uh, as you might be able to use their customs broker. So there are a number of information you'll need for the customs clearance. So who's the exporter? If they are in the EU, do they have an EU EORI number? as this is required now to move goods uh, in and out of the EU to the UK. Who can process the declaration for you? We've touched on that. Um, is there any duty and VAT? How to pay it? We've touched on that. The transport, you will need to find out what is the port of exit in the country of, this, of origin. So let's say in France, um, are the goods living by a Calais? Uh, you will need to find out. You will need to find out what the truck uh, registration or the ferry name or the vessel name or uh, whatever the mode of transport is, you will need to find out all the transport information and the port of exit um, for the country of origin. The um, other um, aspect of Incoterm is that you might be um, responsible for arranging the transport um, or to pick up the goods. So uh, we've touched on XWorks earlier, and I've mentioned that you are responsible for loading the goods on the carrier as well. So that's the main difference with FCA. A lot of the time, it's not always respected. So with XWorks, the exporter will often load the goods, but if something happens, they're not covered. So whether you're the exporter or the importer, please uh, make sure you respect the terms. If you want to load the goods, then just use FCA, um, but don't change uh, the interpretation of that or you won't be covered in case of an accident. Um, so there are other uh, terms, as we've discussed, where the transport might stop, for example, with FOB free on board. Once the goods have been loaded on the vessel, then as the importer, this is where you will be taking responsibility. Uh, with DPD, you don't have to worry about uh, the transport, but just refer back to one of these infographic. Um, they are a lot on the internet as well, so you can just refer back to that and see where you need to um, be responsible. Some income terms also include insurance, so CIF, cost and insurance freight. Um, so if you use one of those, you'll also be responsible for um, adding an insurance uh, along the transport. 
So um, another part of this is to consider what the best route is for your product to make it to you and what the costs are. So if you do not have a freight forwarder to speak to about this, uh, please let us know. We have uh, many members in membership in that industry and we can share a list with you if you want to uh, speak to someone about this. So uh, that's at step two. The goods have left, um, let's say, France, and they are on their way to the United Kingdom. In that stage, um, you need to, you might need to consider the import custom declaration and the payment of duty and VAT if applicable. So again, this will depend on the income terms. Um, the only one where this wouldn't be accurate is DZP. Um, so if you're using any of the other terms, you will be um, responsible for the customs declaration and the payment of uh, taxes. So um, if you've been attending a lot of webinars since the 1st of January or even in the last year, you're probably sick of hearing that you need the EORI number, but you need a EORI number now um, if you want to move goods um, between the UK and third countries, whether it's the EU or not the EU. Uh, if you don't have one yet um, and you want one, you can just request one for free with the HMRC. Um, as I said at the start, um, everything we're saying now is applicable to the EU. So um, since the 1st of January, you need a URI number with the EU and you need to complete customs declaration. So completing customs declaration, especially at import, can be quite complex. And if you want to do it yourself, you will need a compatible software to do it. Uh, so you will need to invest in the software, you will need to invest in training, and um, you will need to buy the port badges. So um, it can be quite um, expensive, or you can uh, get it through a freight forwarder or a customs broker to do this for you. So um, again, if you haven't been doing customs decoration yet, you can um, speak to someone and check the processes and cost. So if you were importing from the EU um, from the 1st of January, you've had uh, some time to delay the completion of customs declaration, which is basically six months from the time of arrival. Um, so if you've had uh, any shipment from the EU since the 1st of January, you haven't done the customs declaration, you need to do it um, as soon as possible to make sure that if HMRC comes to you, you can uh, show them evidence that all the customs processes have been um, completed. So um, there are a number of uh, information that you need on your customs declaration. This is quite similar to what was on the export declaration, but um, the import declaration asks for a little bit more information and can be a little bit more um, difficult. Um, so you will need to provide the commodity code, as we discussed, 10 digits, uh, the net weight, the value, and the value per item. So if you have different commodity codes, you will need to um, have a breakdown, any licenses or additional documentation, as we've discussed earlier, if you're looking to uh, claim preferential origin, you need to present the certificate of origin or the invoice declaration and ask your customer's broker to um, declare it for you and claim the preference. You will need the information about the exporter and the importer, and you will need the transport details. So um, again, the same as the export declaration, but the other side. So uh, Chief, which is the customs handling import of import and export freight, will want to know where the goods are coming in. So for example, let's say Dover, um, where's the truck registration number, where is the truck nationality? So exactly the same as export. If it's coming by a port and a vessel, what's his name, what flag uh, is it under? So you just need to have all this information available to you so you can share with your customs broker or your freight forwarder. And I think you, Levis, you've got a second poll at this stage. Hey. Yes, on this uh, topic, we would like to know what have you considered in terms of customs with the EU? Are you doing it yourselves or are you using an existing customs agent? Are you looking to appoint a new customs agent? Are you still undecided or is this not applicable to you? Just a couple of seconds more to for everyone to answer. And then we'll share the results. All right, so we have um, around 45% using an existing uh, customs agent. There is a couple of people doing it themselves, and uh, we also have people who's undecided or looking to appoint a new customs agent. 
Over to you, Pauline. Thank you, Yolavis. So it's quite interesting to see that most of you are quite familiar already with the um, custom decoration processes. Um, so the next aspect of the customs clearance is the payment of duty and VAT. So all imports coming from the EU and outside the EU are now subject to import VAT unless they are under um, medical appliances or uh, can be zero rated. But the standard rate in the UK is 20%. So depending on your product, you might also have to pay duty um, and um, you will need, you have different methods of payment available to you uh, to pay this. So I've listed a few here. You've got a deferment account. So if you've got a deferment account, you can just put the payment on there uh, or you can use sometimes your customs broker or your freight agents uh, deferment account. The flexible accounting system. So a fast payment is when you pay directly to HMRC. So um, you get a, um, a link and a reference and you just need to make the payment before your goods can be uh, cleared and uh, you can get your customs declaration. And uh, finally, there's been um, since the 1st of January, the option for postponed VAT accounting on import from the EU. So um, if you don't want to pay upfront and you want to account for it in your VAT return, you can use those options. Um, depending on uh, what the goods are, where they're from and what you plan to do with them, you might also be able to delay or reduce the amount of duty you pay. So there are a number of customs processes and schemes which can be used in specific situations. I've uh, listed a couple here. Um, we wouldn't go into details into everything. That would be as well another complete session. But for example, customs warehouse, if you've got a bonded warehouse in the UK and you're importing goods to place them into that warehouse, you will not have to pay um, the duty until unless they are released into free circulation or you are re-exporting them, in which case you won't have to pay any duty. You've got uh, in-world and outward processing relief, which can be very helpful if you have to import or export goods for um, repair. Um, so if you're importing goods into the UK to repair them and then sell them back, you won't need to pay a duty at import. Or if you're selling, sending them to Germany to be repaired and then re-importing them, if you have an authorization to use IPR or OPR, you can claim duty relief. And so if you do that a lot, and I know a lot of businesses that we've worked with had this kind of relationship with the EU suppliers, and since the 1st of January are being hit with duty, you can just use one of these schemes um, to um, claim duty relief. Um, so there are a lot more schemes. Um, I know we're looking at doing special procedures webinars. So once we've got this kind of information, if this is of interest to you, uh, we can send um, over. So uh, finally, you've had you've agreed your terms of sales. The goods left the country of origin. They've arrived in the UK. You've got everything there. It doesn't stop here. So um, you must keep a clear trail of your import and customs procedures for potential audits from HMRC. Most documents have to be kept for at least four years. So when your customs broker do an import declaration for you, they will send you a C88 and an E2, and you need to keep those documents on file for four years um, in case HMRC wants to see any proof or, of import or any evidence. Um, you will also need to keep, if you've claimed any preference, a, preferential rate um, you will need to keep that and the proof of origin if you've got a certificate of origin from your Polish supplier for example you will need to keep a copy so there is a link on this slide as well where you can see what the um, audit time is for um, international trade documents so once we send you the slide you'll be able to refer back to that website to see exactly how long uh, your documents must be kept. So I think there's a third poll here, your ladies. Yes, we're interested in knowing um, what has been your experiences with moving goods since the 1st of January. So has it been very easy, moderately easy, moderately difficult or very difficult? Or is that not applicable to you? We've, we're already into five months into the 1st of January. so. I'm sure almost everyone has already um, experienced the changes. So just a couple of um, seconds more for everyone to reply and then we'll share the results.
All right, so 40% has found it uh, moderately difficult, 20% very difficult, only 10% have found it moderately easy. Um, there are still 5% who find it too early to say, and 25% is not applicable. Okay. Over to you. Thank you, Yolevis. So again, it's quite interesting to see um, the spread of uh, people that found it easy or difficult. Um, thankfully, um, the delay of completing the creation within six months of arriving um, has been quite helpful with a lot of businesses that are only just now understanding the implications of uh, buying and selling from the EU. So um, as I said, if you're only just realizing now that you've had shipment coming from the EU that haven't had their custom decoration and you haven't paid the VAT or the duty on it yet, um, make sure um, you, um, you look into that soon. If you need any help with that, please get in touch with the team and we'll support you as much as we can. So um, th this was quite short. So um, this was only a half an hour to uh, introduce you to import ba basics and the steps involved in customs processes. I hope this was useful. If you want anything more in depth or any more uh, bespoke support, please get in touch with us after um, today and we'll help us as much as we can. We've got a range of international trade courses that we can refer you to. And for those of you that are not aware, there is currently a grant through the SME's Brexit Support Fund, where you can claim up to £2,000 per business to pay for support to help you adapt to the new customs and trade rules with the European Union. So you can claim a grant, uh, either a training grant or a consultancy grant. So if you need professional advice or training, um, you can get some support at the moment. Applications close at the end of June 2021. And I know there has been quite a lot of applications already. There's only 20 million available. So if you haven't applied, um, I'd really recommend you look into this soon um, as uh, it will soon be too late. Um, so yeah, that's it for me. Thank you very much for um, coming. And I think you ladies just want to highlight a few more things and then we'll open up for a Q&A. Yeah. Yeah, so we've got here a list of our coming events and training. You'll receive a copy of the site, as Pauline said, so you'll be able to see these. And if you want to book into anything, you can do so um, through the website. And we also have um, upcoming bite-sized sessions. We are, we are also going to confirm some um, further ones, so um, keep an eye on that. And before um, we go on to the q and I'm just going to launch a feedback poll, which is going to help us um, see how we're doing with these sessions and to improve uh, future ones. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to drop them on the Q&A box or on the chat and we'll be happy to answer them. So we've already got one here from Martin. And it says, uh, your slide suggests that VIT is now due irrespective of origin of goods. So does that mean VIT is now due on all imports from China? And this is only since January? So VAT, the only reason why you wouldn't pay VAT depends on the um, type of product. So sometimes some food, food products can be zero rated. Some medical products can be zero rated. Um, I would assume that there would be uh, VAT applicable to China unless they are a um, specific type of product. So when you do the VAT payment, when we do the customer's declaration, um, the origin wouldn't affect the... Um, the VAT payment or the VAT calculation. All right. Um, a follow-up says, but no VAT outbound. Do you mean for export or import into China? Imports from China. For export to China, oh, I think, um, again, it will depend on what you're exporting. So if you want to send us an email after today and send us your commodity code, we can look into it and tell you what duty and buy is applicable, both on import and export. Um, I think you'll, you, you must have your ABC's email already, so feel free to send us the detail of the code um, of the product you're exporting from. Yes, and I'm also sending our... Um, email address on the group chat. So if you would like to send any further queries, for, feel free to email us to that address as well. We've got here another question from Karina. It says, any imports that not pay duty or VAT yet, 
um, look into that soon. Please, can you send more info on how to look into these? How do we apply to see what will, etc.? But uh, we have had little to no help from more freight forwarders. Okay, so uh, what you need to do is you will need to ask someone to do that import declaration for you. And once they've done the import declaration, they can tell you how much duty and VAT is owed. So you can check if there's any duty on that website that we've shared, but um, the VAT will probably be 20% depending on what you're importing. So we can send you an email with more information after um, the session on how you can do your customs declaration now. You have uh, six months from the day you've imported the goods um, to do that customs declaration. So if you've imported the goods in February, you had six months from February to do it. So um, if you've done it in January, look into it very soon because it will soon come to July, uh, to June, sorry. Uh, but yeah, Karina, we've got, um, I'll make a note to send you um, some details on that as soon as we can. Thank you. We've got another question here that we are actually getting quite often lately. And it's why are the commodity difference in length or for imports and exports? Because the last two digits are specific to the UK. So that's what will determine what um, duty is applicable. So the first six digits are internationally uh, the same. Uh, on export, it will be eight. And then on import to the other countries, they will add their two digits uh, to calculate the duty applicable in their country. So in the EU, it will be EU-wide 10 digits. But in the UK, now we've got our own system. So it will be the last two system will be, um, the last two digits will be UK digits. Yeah, and if you are um, if you are important, is it? It's very important that you provide the ten-digit commodity codes because otherwise, import declarations cannot be completed. And we have another one. How can uh, we claim um, VAT back on exports to the EU? So it will depend on which EU country you might have to register uh, for VAT in that country so that you can claim back. Um, again, we can send you some more information after as this is specific to each country. So if you send us some details as to um, the specific situation you're looking at, we can uh, see if we can help you claim that um, VAT. Yeah, so we have some more details and we can look into that after the meeting. So it's from Sweden. We have another question. It says, if a small sample order is placed and delivered uh, via DHL, do we still need to go through the import procedure if the goods from China? So when you use uh, fast courier parcel uh, services, they are often um, doing that for you. So if you're using DHL, I would um, recommend you speak to them to ask them if they are doing it for you. They are usually charging you for it. So um, you need as well to check what price they are um, charging you. And also you need to have a copy of the import declaration. So you need to ask them for a copy. So sometimes with companies like DHL or UPS, you have an online platform. So I don't know if this is the case for you, but you might have an online platform when you can log in, see the shipments um, that you've had going via them, and you might be able to download um, the declarations, but you need to make sure they do it. If they're not doing it, um, that's a problem. So they're probably doing it. It's usually part of the service. Um, so I would recommend you speak to your account manager at, at DHL. All right, thank you. Um, are there any further questions? If so, you can um, drop them now on the chat. I think we've answered to everything that has been sent up to now. And as you, as your lady said, if you've got any questions, uh, additional question or any specific situation you want help with please uh, drop us an email and we'll help as much as we can and Karina I will send you a, an email this afternoon. Yes and we will be sending out a follow-up as well with the slides and recordings so that you can re-watch this and find out some more further information. So I think this is all we haven't got any further questions so uh, thank you everyone for attending this session. Feel, feel free to look into our website to see any further training or events.